if you look at the world around you, um, what you see is what we call matter. This is what we say ordinary matter. But um, way back at the beginning, near the beginning of the Big Bang, we believe that there was a, a symmetry that was an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Obviously, the universe has changed since the, those very early moments in time, which were on the order of you know, millisecond or microsecond after the Big Bang. And the question is, what happened? How did we end up with uh, a universe which is dominated um, by matter? We see antimatter in experiments on Earth, but we have to create that antimatter using a very high energy experiments. So we know antimatter exists. We know that antimatter has almost exactly the same properties as matter. That means we, for every particle of matter that we know about, like the proton or the electron, um, there is a corresponding uh, antiparticle, uh, antiproton, antielectron. Um, this is well known. And the particles and antiparticles uh, have, uh, say, the proton and the antiproton have the same mass. Um, they have the same uh, charge. They have the same uh, magnetic moment. They have almost everything the same, except that when you bring a particle in the vicinity of an antiparticle, they annihilate. They uh, annihilate with each other and create energy and photons. And this is a very uh, dramatic, violent event. Um, when we create uh, antimatter uh, in the lab at high energy facilities, we can see when the antimatter interacts with matter, this extremely high energy event occur. So one can ask the question, why if as we believe there was an equal amount of matter and antimatter in the universe at the beginning, why when we look out into the world on Earth or even when we look out with telescopes out into the, the cosmos, we see essentially only matter. And it's believed, and this theory was first uh, put forward by Sakharov in the 1960s, we believe that a certain set of conditions uh, occurred during the first few milliseconds of the existence of the universe that preferred matter over antimatter. And Sakharov gave uh, a set of uh, conditions or a set of processes that must occur for matter to be favored. And I might say that the theory is that matter was favored only a little bit. That means that almost all of the matter and antimatter in the universe annihilated, but one part in a billion of the matter was left over. So it was a very, very small asymmetry. And there were a few conditions that Sakharov uh, outlined for this uh, matter asymmetry to occur. And one of the conditions was something what we call time reversal violation. So time reversal uh, is a symmetry that we uh, expect to see in nature. And it does in general exist in all physical processes, but it can sometimes be violated. So let me explain what time reversal symmetry is. So time reversal symmetry uh, is very easy to see mathematically, a little bit harder to see physically. So mathematically, one has a set of equations, physics equations, like force equals mass times acceleration, or conservation of energy. And we can use these equations to predict, for example, the path a ball takes as it bounces along the ground, or some other uh, physical phenomenon. Now, if we look at those equations and we replace time by minus time, right? What we find is the equations behave almost exactly the same. In other words, in all in the cases, the most common cases, these things of classic parts of classical physics, they behave exactly the same. And this is what's called time reversal symmetry. And so physically, you can think of this: if I have a ball and it starts to bounce around the room like so, if I reverse time, it's just going backwards. But the equations of motion, the physics equations, are essentially the same. Now, on the microscopic scale, we know that this is violated to some small amount. We can see this violation in the high energy uh, uh, processes, which occur in some special cases in particles. Now, this time reversal violation that we see in high energy experiments is not enough 
to explain, according to Sakharov's theory, the matter-antimatter asymmetry we see here in the universe now. It's simply not enough. So we have a mystery on our hands. We need new physics to somehow explain what we see every day in the universe. And we don't exactly know where to find it. However, there is one approach that we're taking, and that was pioneered first by Professor Norman Ramsey um, here at Harvard and a number of co-workers, and most recently has been, uh, been work done by Ed Hines at Imperial College in London. And we have an experiment here at Harvard, which is a collaboration between three uh, experimentalists, myself, Professor Gabrielis, and Professor DeMille from Yale. And what we're looking for is new signs of time reversal violation. This kind of time reversal violation with the right amount that would describe this matter-antimatter asymmetry. And the way that we're looking for it is perhaps a bit surprising. What we're looking for is we're looking for a change in the properties of the electron. So the electron, as you might know, is a, is, is, has charge. It's the electron charge. And it also has a magnetic moment. So it's as if the electron are, is spinning around in a circle. You might think is if we reverse time, if the electron acts like a charge spinning around in a circle in one direction, when we reverse time, then the electron charge will spin in the opposite direction. And we could tell that difference if we reverse time, this is just a thought experiment, because we would see the magnetic moment of the electron change direction. When the electron's spinning in one direction, then the magnetic moment points this way. If the electron is spinning in the opposite direction, the magnetic moment will point this way. And this is one of the, the uh, fundamental uh, properties of time reversal when it comes to charges and magnetic moments. If the electron not only has a magnetic moment, but also has an electric dipole moment, that means that the electron is not perfectly round, but it's a little bit oval, then that's equivalent to there being a little bit of extra positive charge here and a little bit of extra negative charge there. And that's what we call an electric dipole. Now you can imagine is if, we, if the electron has an electric dipole and we reverse time, nothing happens. With a magnetic dipole, the current goes in an opposite direction. But if I reverse time, then the charges simply stay still. And because the electric dipole would not change, but the magnetic dipole would change, that, is, that violates time reversal symmetry. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the electric dipole moment of the electron. It has never been seen. It's been looked for for the past 50 years, and uh, it has not been seen. What we've done is place limits on the size of the electric dipole moment of the electron. Now, it turns out that many of the theories that we expect to be true about particle physics, new theories about particle physics, predict an electric dipole moment in a range of values that our experiment is now sensitive to. That is saying that in places like Geneva, where they're using the Large, large Hadron Collider, they're looking to produce these new heavy particles, just regular matter, new heavy particles. These new heavy particles, if they exist, they would actually give rise to the electric dipole moment of the electron. Now you may ask, how is that possible? And that is because the electron, it sits in the vacuum, but an electron in a vacuum is a lot more interesting than you might think. The electron um, produces a field, and that means there's energy in that field. And so for short moments of time, that energy can actually create new particles. These are what are called virtual particles. And those new particles, which are predicted by many physics theories can actually give rise to this electric dipole moment. And so not only are we looking for the time reversal violation that Sakharov asked for to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry, we are also looking for the particles that give rise to it, these new particles. So we are, by looking for the electric dipole moment of the electron, we are looking 
for the same kind of particles that very large high energy colliders are looking for. And so the way that we do the experiment is we take electrons and we put them in a very high electric field. That very high electric field can interact with the electric dipole moment of the electron. And then we see a small energy shift. We look using lasers for a small energy shift depending on whether the electron is parallel to the electric field or anti-parallel. And by looking for a small energy shift, because the electric dipole moment will interact with the electric field, we can look for the electric dipole moment of the electron. The final interesting point about how we do the experiment is that the electric field we use is actually inside of a molecule. So we take a molecule and we use the electrons that are inside the molecule itself to probe this electric dipole moment of the electron. So if what can be brought to the field of uh, particle physics and our understanding of cosmology is if the electric dipole moment of, moment of the electron is found at the level we're looking for, it would be strong evidence for these new particles, which would be a fundamental new understanding of the particle structure of the universe. And it would also be the first evidence for Sakharov's theory of matter-antimatter asymmetry.